I welcome everybody on this really cold day to uh, Yale last program for Yale Springs Historical Society for 2022. We're working on our, our series of programs for next year, uh, but then we'll come out with those probably early in uh, 2023. But we've got we've saved one of the best programs for the last this year, and uh, our our board member uh, David Kaysenheiser and Scott Sanders, who was a former board member, although we, we keep trying to keep him on there forever. Whether he likes it or not. Whether he likes it or not. And the uh, archivist at uh, Antioch College are going to uh, give a program that I think is really timely on the Antioch College power plant, which, uh, uh, based on what I've seen, is no more. It's pretty well cleaned out. But, but we're going to hear about the history of and uh, why it came to be, why it came to be where it was located, and, uh, uh, and what happened uh, over the course of time with that. So, no further ado, I don't know how you feel right. we're going to light this up. Yeah, All right. Hey, wow. Can everybody hear us? Can you hear us? Good. All right. Excuse me for pointing. Go ahead and we can All right. light it up. So it's actually been quite a long time since I've talked to all of you. Uh, like, I think three years since I gave my last historical society program. Lots of change here. Uh, like, equipment works great. Uh, pretty excited about that. Now, we've all watched the Antioch College power plant uh, going down uh, low these past several weeks. And uh, so it interests me how it was that it you know, came to be in the first place. It's a highly inventive and innovative thing that Antioch College did. And so if you're talking about invention and innovation at Antioch, you are undoubtedly talking about Arthur Morton. So this is Arthur at the Cascades in Glen Helen. Um, he became president of the college in 1920. And the college that he took over still looked like this. <laughs> This is the earliest known photograph of the Antioch College campus, taken about 1860. We had three buildings, and when Arthur Morgan became president 70 years later, we still had three buildings. Uh, and he would change that pretty quickly, actually, uh, and build several new buildings for the college. Um, he would build a library, he would build a dormitory, and one of the most pressing needs that the college had was classroom space. All instruction happened inside uh, Antioch College's main building for the first half of its history. And what you can see here in the late 19th century is uh, a science class, um, but they're sharing that classroom with a drawing class, and that's what some of this other apparatus is too. And one of the things that Morgan's Antioch did was expanded science faculty uh, pretty dramatically. Right. And what they needed and wanted more than anything was room to move around and work. And so one of the people that Morgan brought in to help revitalize the Antioch College that he took over uh, was a, an industrialist and philanthropist named Charles Kettering. So Kettering and Arthur met because Morgan came to town to build five dams around the Miami Valley uh, that continue to keep us uh, dry. That's the Miami Conservancy District. The five dams in the Montgomery County area that have, to this day still continue to work to keep the flooding down. So as a result of that, and perhaps other things that I don't know about, uh, Kettering was understandably uh, inspired by Arthur Morgan. And so when Morgan, you know, Morgan became president of Antioch because he built these dams, and that's the easiest way to describe it. Uh, and so Morgan brought in, uh, you know, uh, well-heeled supporters uh, to help bankroll this new college that he, that he was going to create out of this old one, and he did just that. So Kettering is a major source for finances uh, in the early uh, Antioch College. Um, the story goes that uh, uh, 
Kettering used to like to come out to Yellow Springs from Dayton uh, to have lunch. And that was at uh, a little uh, restaurant that the college operated called the Antioch Tea Room. And so uh, the science faculty would dine with Mr. Kettering. And so they had a uh, kind of a sneaky plan. And that was they wanted this new academic building that, in fact, uh, they had already uh, kind of designed in their heads and made some drawings. And so uh, they were having lunch with Kettering and steered the conversation to buildings. And once they got kind of engaged in discussing buildings, they talked about the kind of stuff that they would like to have for uh, a, what we were trying to build a state-of-the-art science curriculum. And this Kettering is supposed to be like, well, what do you have in mind? And then someone reaches around, finds a drawing, and be like, this! <laughs> <laughs> that! There it is. Wow. So this is a drawing of the, or it's a photograph, actually, of a model <laughs> that was created by uh, uh, an engineering firm up in Springfield called Eastman and Budkin. Uh, you might know the Eastman family. Uh, this would be Richard Eastman's father, uh, Robin. Um, and so, uh, having inspired Kettering with this model of a new science building for the college, uh, he simply decided that he should pay for it, uh, which was nice of him. And in him paying for it, uh, what he got in return was the third floor. Uh, so the entire top floor of the science building would be given over uh, to Kettering's newly created scientific uh, enterprise, the Kettering Foundation. And the Kettering Foundation would dedicate itself to unlocking the secret of photosynthesis. I don't think they ever did it, but that's immaterial. So beginning in the late 1920s, uh, Antioch began, began constructing this building. And here's one of the earliest shots of the construction project. And you can just get a sense of how big it is. And one of the things that's always intrigued me about this project is this massive crane that was put right on site uh, for, uh, for this. And you can see also the gymnasium is pretty new at that point. That was also one of Mr. Eastman's designs, was the curled gymnasium in the background. So in the process of doing this, when did they decide that they were going to take up too much room for the heating plant? So that's where all this uh, uh, moves toward a power plant. I don't actually know when they came up with the, the idea. But you can, as the project is progressing, wow. the, uh, uh, it comes to uh, how are we going to uh, you know, heat this building, this enormous building. Because if you go back to that very first, if you don't, cause can you do that, the very first one that you showed us? If you, mm -hmm. no, it's right, it's there, there, there's yeah. the three buildings, excuse three me, buildings. there, yeah. mm -hmm. if you look, in the background here, both North and South Hall had fireplaces, fireplaces not fireplaces, but they were probably Stoves. boilers mm -hmm. that were coal fired, that's how they heated and the privies were on the back side as well. Think about well, it. Should be. Yeah. <laughs> Main building had its own stacks, which are and now gone. There's one on this side, and there was another one on the other side. Actually, there were four of them at one time, but that's the one you can see coming through the roof now. They, so they were heated independently from each other. That's right. Because Everybody was on their own for their heat. Right, because as we progress in this, we're going to talk about how they got heat from the power plant as it's yet to be built to these buildings. Stealing your own thunder, aren't you? <laughs> well, you probably know that Antioch College for many years had a, a student-run fire department called Maples. Yep. Um, so what they say about uh, uh, before there was the student fire, de fire department Maples, because of all of these stoves, wood fired stoves in everybody's room, Everybody was a member of Maple as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Now, yeah. as this building is progressing, uh, what we find out is that as big as it is, 
the science faculty does not want to devote such substantial space to this building, and my God, look at the size of it, mm -hmm. to the heating plant that it would require, enormous. So this is where the uh, innovation and invention begins to really move toward uh, our topic today. Um, using, uh, uh, well, uh, the research for the best way to heat this enormous building uh, was to have an external building providing the heat, uh, which was a pretty common way of, of building, uh, like a college campus, for instance, uh, in this case, where uh, in order to maximize the space inside your own building, you build your, your heating plant externally. So um, the research showed that the most efficient way to generate heat was in fact to generate electricity. And so if you did that, then you would use uh, the steam that was created as a byproduct from the creation of electricity, uh, and that would heat this building. And then Morgan began to put all of this thing together and realized that the building that they were going that they were building wasn't just for this. It was powerful enough to do quite a lot more than this building. This is an Axel Banson photograph, by the way. But rather, it could be used to uh, heat the entire campus. So, with steam produced in the power plant, it could be uh, uh, pushed through steam tunnels, which could then be used to uh, heat all of the other buildings on campus. In fact, the, the electricity generated could, was more than enough to uh, power and light the campus. Uh, Casey, what was the state of electricity uh, when this was started? So when it started out, they were getting electricity, what little AC electricity, <coughs> which would have been for, for lighting, came from, believe it or not, came from Clifton Mill. <laughs> and there was also a DC line direct current line that came up from Xenia and it was what powered the uh, interurban rail. They had street lights here in town that were used, that used that DC current that at night they would shut them off. When the <laughs> rail system went, went down for the evening, everything was shut down so there were no more lights. But they were using electricity primarily out on what was Dayton Street and would have been along the rail siding here. We had two feed mills, and there was also the DeWine property, the DeWine mill, further down. And more of the businesses were on Dayton Street at that time than are, are now. That was, that was the business district. So that's where they were getting electricity. And the other thing was later, after DPNL started buying up <coughs> the services for Cedarville and Clifton, um, they were getting their AC service coming up from Xenia. And there was a real problem with tree limbs and trees falling across the electric lines and causing <laughs> outages. Just like today, sometimes for as long as a week, they would be without power. So there, was a, there were a lot of issues that could be resolved with the building of this power plant. And the question then became, where's a good place to put it? How about down in a hole? Down in a hole. <laughs> so this is the earliest construction uh, shot we have of the power plant. Um, this is the base of the smokestack right here. That's what you're looking at. The thing that snapped that cable <coughs> from the time they tried to pull it out? Right. <laughs> and so fortunately, uh, Antioch College didn't have to dig this hole. It was already there. Right. Because of the main industry that, uh, that Yellow Springs had uh, in the 19th century, which was what? Limestone, quarrying limestone. In the uh, 1870s, the, quarry, the first quarry was owned by the Shrouth family. And there they are. This was uh, 1874, is this drawing from the 1874 uh, county almanac or the county atlas. And it shows the kilns alongside of the railroad siding. The interesting thing was that the first quarry, the one that's furthest north toward 
68, the quality of the stone was such that it wasn't real good for making cement, but it was good for agricultural lime, <coughs> which they use a lot of around here to this day, putting it on the fields. So they went further south toward <coughs> Cornell Road and started a second quarry. So there's actually two quarries. Mm -hmm. And that quarry, the quality of the stone showed that it was, it was amenable for making cement. But this, this is the one that we have where it was positioned today, and it, the picture doesn't really do it justice. But well, one of the really important things was there was a railroad siding right here. And that was different from the inner urban. This was the freight, freight line. Yeah, Pennsylvania Railroad by then. Yes. This is more or less what that hole looked like when, the, uh, when Arthur Morgan came on the scene. This photo is from the first decade of the 20th century. And if you're looking at this, excuse me, this is the side where the rail, the railroad runs along where you can see the electric lines coming up along the railroad there. And telephone and telegraph, or maybe just telegraph. Uh, and so it's not the most attractive space in the world, uh, and not even a hand-colored postcard could make it look better. <laughs> yeah, it's just a big hole in the ground. Right. And so the... I heard this story for uh, many years ago, uh, and it seemed really strange at the time, and that was the decision to put the power plant down in the quarry was based on how ugly somebody thought the building was. Uh, right. And that's just crazy, uh, because actually it, uh, it has a very real reason to be there. But in order to make this, you know, kind of rough looking hole look better, uh, the college considered landscaping. This is actually a part of our collection at Antiochiana, and it is a landscape architect's design for uh, uh, turning the quarry into what was known as the Dingle. Now, the Dingle was uh, all the brainchild of a member of the Board of Trustees, uh, this woman right here. This is Jesse Armstrong. Um, now the Armstrongs are uh, what out of Chicago? They were originally. Yeah. Okay, and uh, Casey's going to tell you how they made their money. Well, her husband designed, came up with a design for a governor for a for electric for turbines. A governor, if you it utilizes centrifugal force to regulate the speed. Have you ever seen a governor? It looks like a funny little pin. We don't have any pictures of them, with weights, counterweights. And when they moved, the faster it moved, the higher the counterweights would go up on the column. And then you could regulate how fast or how slow the engine ran by how, how much weight you extended out on the arms. Mm -hmm. They're still used today in a lot of big electric, uh, electric motors because mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's an efficient way of doing it. And Mrs. Armstrong's husband's design was patented and used extensively, and there, so she ended up with, they ended up with a lot of money as a result of that because it was a better design than anything anybody had previously. What was their connection with that? Well, she was, how did that work? Well, they have no, no, uh, no. like familial tie here. to the college. Yeah. Uh, but Arthur Morgan was good at finding uh, progressive industrialist types to support Antioch College. Uh, now, we're assuming that, that the person that he really cultivated and recruited was Mr. Armstrong. But it's Mrs. Armstrong whose activity is on the board that we actually know about. Uh, so what you see here is she's laying the cornerstone for Birch Hall in 1946. And Accompanying her are, on the left, uh, Boyd Alexander, who was dean of faculty of the college for many years. He was a business administration professor that was hired by Arthur Morgan. And then the man over her left shoulder, you might have heard of him, C. Herbert Ellis, uh, class of 1915, I think, uh, postmaster, uh, man about town, and I'm pretty sure that it, there's a uh, there's a bond named after him. Right. <laughs> and interestingly enough, the Ellis Park, Ellis Pond, was the original well field for the village. 
That's where we got our drinking water originally. And it was piped from there, pumped down to High Street, where uh, ElectroShield is today. For a long time, that was the village garage. And there was a big water tower that sat behind there, hence the name for Tower Court, which came right after World War II. And those houses built by Max Mercer and his brother stood in the, sh in the shadow of that water tower. Oh, nice. I did not know that. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up there. Yeah, so, Mrs. There Armstrong had, uh, uh, you know, her role in all of this was she led the charge to landscape this hole mm -hmm. into uh, something that we could be proud of. And this odd name that she gave to it, the Dingle, comes from her favorite public park in England, the Dingle in Shrewsbury. And Shrewsbury is this park called the Dingle, and she loved that place. And so what she tried to do is model, <coughs> model the, the uh, quarry into the Dingle. Here's another shot of the uh, Baker Arbor in the Dingle. Uh, and so a landscape project also went along with the construction. So here's some more construction shots of uh, building, building this building. And you can see from the get-go, this thing is solid. Um, and probably we haven't commenced with any landscaping yet. Um, and you see with the very first uh, construction against the wall of the quarry, these are going to be coal hoppers. Right, the shoots from the coal. If you look, up here is a boxcar right here. So it gives you a sense of how, of scale. We're looking west. You would be looking, looking south. south. Yeah, that's looking south. south along. Yes. So think of that as Cory Street in the bike path. And of course, that's where the boxcar is. It's on the bike path. Exactly. Uh, and so this is key for the development of the power plant that it's built so close to the railroad. How did they drain the swamp? We're getting there. We're getting there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so some more construction. You can see. Uh, really, this is probably uh, just a different angle on the same day. Right. Um, Case, do you want to say anything about this? Yeah, if you look over here on the other side, you can begin to see the tunneling that's gone under Cory Street. And it's going to continue down what was, because if you drove down there, that's where South College Street used to come out. Right. It was right there on Cory. And that tunnel goes under the sidewalk over toward the science building, goes to the science building, then follows the sidewalk up to main building, over to North Hall and the South Hall. And that's where they ran the steam lines under there, as well as the electric lines when they were generating their own electricity. They went underneath there. It's uh, when we were kids and we'd go sledding on Suicide Hill. How many of you remember where Suicide is? <laughs> you'd be walking home to Toward supper time, and it would be cold and wet, and you could go and just sit on the sidewalk because it was warm and dry because the steam lines ran underneath. It. You laugh. It was <laughs> came in handy. It did, especially on a day like today. Uh, just another detail: this gambrel roof structure right yes. here, uh, I think, was a dairy barn. Was for many years the college's engineering department, right? Uh, and its last life was the Antioch College. Uh, art building. Yeah, and part of the area theater too. Yeah, yeah. I think part of it went into the uh, to the theater building that we have now, right. uh, and then of course it was replaced by the uh, by the ant farm design building that went up in the 1970s. There we go. So here we here it is. It's all done. I picked out the winter shot just for tomorrow. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And oh. at, actually, it looks like they're still building it, but what? What you can see here very clearly is the siding. And so so they, that's no, right. that's how we get coal into the off to the into side. the plant. How many coal cars full of coal could you hold in sh the chutes at the time, David? At a time, there were seven, eight, eight bins. Wow. Eight bins. Okay. And they would hold a fifty-ton car load of coal each. So you're talking what four hundred? 50 bins, 800 pounds, 40 pounds. Whatever. A lot. A whole bunch. Many times. <laughs> Thank you. 
the end bin next to the buffer on the right. Right here. Now uh, Mr. Carr would lease and get a car a little bit cold for the nursery. Ah, okay. And during the Depression, faculty members that lived in the houses along uh, Davis Street facing south and Limestone Street facing north, the Mills Lawn <coughs> campus, if you will, were provided with coal to keep their houses warm. That was part of, the, part of the deal. When you were living in faculty housing, you were provided with a source of heat for during the Depression. And the barn back here is the same one we were talking about that yeah. was the engineering building. But during, I forget when they closed off South College Street, but there were houses all along that side of South College. It was in the mid-50s. In the mid-50s, okay. Before yeah. they shut it, they closed off South College and they closed off the Center College, North College Street from Livermore down to Quarry. There were three houses that were between the college gym and the science building right. that all were owned, I believe, by the Lawson family. Mm -hmm. And uh, the college bought that property uh, in the late 40s, early 50s, and then built Olive Kettering Library on that spot. Uh, and also built it forward the other two uh, uh, buildings, uh, and that appears to have been the agent that actually closed it. So if you're standing on the front porch of Olive Kettering Library, you're kind of in the middle of South College Street. Mm -hmm. and you, wanted to, you, were, you showed the picture of Ms. Armstrong. She originally was going to provide the college with the money to purchase this <coughs> land, the 111 acres along Quarry Street, to do this with. And how did that work? Oh. Mr. Kettering came along and said he would he would buy the land, so Mrs. Armstrong's money went to the landscaping project. to the landscaping project further further on. But this is there's 111 acres right along all along Quarry Street that is where this was, and then the next quarry on down, and it ran this way back toward <coughs> Route 68, or where Trailside is today. Thank you. Uh, so here we see some of the uh, landscaping that's happening. Um, they drain the, uh, the swamp, as someone asked, and they're putting a, a limestone wall up to, uh, you know, to contain the pond. Right. It's great the pond. So the company that contracted to build the power plant also contracted to do the tunneling across campus, under the road, across campus, and up to the buildings, and to shoot the hole necessary to drain the <coughs> water out of this area down to Little Miami. And that hole is still there. You can <coughs> stand down there and you're quiet and you can hear water running through it because the pond is still there and it still holds water. Yeah, but you and interestingly you, enough, that yes. The pond is spring fed. Right. When they got to the level of the grass field, the water arrived, they were stuck and they quit. Right. So they engineered this whole thing so that the pond would drain, unlike Ellis, you know. So it is a spring fed. <laughs> so it's running. It's actually a spring fed moving pond. Yeah. It's got potential. Indeed. It's not going to fill up full of. So it was never a swamp. They dug it. What is that, George? Fens drain swamps don't? <laughs> so now. So the building's complete here. It goes online in 1930, um, as does the science building. And at some point in this project, the, Morgan realized that this building was going to generate enough electricity that we could sell it to the village. Right? And uh, that was a great <coughs> idea. Uh, and an exercise in self-reliance, the kind of thing that Arthur Morgan really lived for, um, but Dayton Power and Light didn't think that was such a great idea. <laughs> they didn't like it. Uh, and so, uh, as Ernest Morgan, uh, Arthur's son, told me, um, Dayton Power and Light started leaning on the college to keep them from, and in 1930, I should mention, the power contract between the village of Yellow Springs and Dayton Power and Light was coming open, which meant that other power providers could, uh, could bid on it. 
Um, and so, as Ernest said, they, uh, DPNL uh, kind of leaned on the college. Uh, they would try to, for instance, uh, delay uh, instrumentation delivery uh, to, to the building. Um, they are supposed to have threatened Arthur Morgan with exposing his son's socialist views, uh, not realizing that Arthur Morgan is very unlikely to, like, you know, be embarrassed by his son, uh, at least at this point. Uh, and so uh, none of that worked. Uh, but what really uh, got DPNL out of the way was having Charles Kettering on your side. Uh, and so, uh, thanks to uh, all of that, uh, Arthur being unafraid and, and Kettering uh, uh, really coming to bat for the college, uh, Antioch College won the power contract for Yellow Springs uh, in 1930. And so for the next 15 plus years, uh, all y'all got your electricity uh, from us. Right. And from that. So when they got it, put it online, they laid a cable, underground cable, three conductor, from the power plant, went a little over a mile, about 5,700 feet, and it went along the railroad grade, and went up Dayton Street, and they had a distribution point behind what is, was the Opera House. There some, some of you remember where the Opera House is? It was on the corner of Winter Street and Dayton Street, kitty corner from the Methodist Church. And their transformers were set up there where they could then distribute electricity to the businesses along Dayton Street, and they started providing electricity to residents. And if you think about it, in the early 20s, most homes, those that did have electric lighting, it was pretty minimal. In other words, there would be electric lights that you could turn on probably in the kitchen and maybe in the living room. And the idea of having, you know, 14 outlets in the kitchen for all the, that wasn't what was going on. It was a very, very basic service provided to, to the residents. But it did come from this source. And that cable, what they say, that cable weighed something like 19 tons. It was three conductors, each wrapped individually in lead sheathing, and then a set, another insulation on top of that, and then a third one made out of steel. So when they buried it, it would be you know, probably four to six inches in diameter. And it went down Corey and updates. You see why I brought him along? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and here's a great shot of the pond all done in landscape, and this is pretty much, uh, you know, the the dingle at its uh, at its best. Yeah. You can see very clearly the the, uh, the spur that right. that the coal cars would be backed up to. And they had um, trolleys, a trolley that would take the coal. And correct me if I'm wrong, Dave. Coal from the chutes you could load into the the, the little hopper, powered hopper and it would move it to, they had stokers on the boilers. And so there wasn't a matter of you shoveling coal into the firebox, but you would take the hopper and drive it over and put it in the stoker, and then that was regulated, and it would force, it would, using a screw mechanism, would force coal mm -hmm. up into the firebox of the boiler. Mm -hmm. So that it didn't have to do a lot of shoveling unless there was an accident and somebody spilled some on the ground, but primarily it was mechanically provided. Sounds like an Antioch co-op job to me. <laughs> uh, now this is the uh, uh, interior of the building, and uh, I'm pretty sure these are uh, diesel powered? Those are the, are those diesel or steam powered in that picture? Diesel, diesel. okay, thank Two you. Two lines coming in from the road. Okay, which oh, they are steam. There's, steam. Yeah, no. okay. So there's, uh, you know, that's the money part of the of the building in terms of like the generation of the power. And prior, part of what this is about is the demand. Of course, once it was available, it increased. People wanted more. And so sometimes the ability to provide enough electricity with the steam power, steam driven ones, wasn't sufficient. So they went to the, went to, added these as auxiliary generators to, to put more power online. 
Is are that one of those ones that you restored? And where did that go when it was restored? You don't know. Okay. David, yeah, David rebuilt one of these and brought it back to its original state, and it was later moved to a museum someplace. No, it wasn't. It wasn't. Yeah. It was it crowd. It went, that seems kidding. more likely. Uh, excuse me. I thought one of them was. I thought one of them was saved. Yeah, it's the guy that owned the welding business in Zinia bought one of them. Okay. He bought the engine, not the generator. I got you. All right, right. Casey. Yes. Are, are the diesels in this photograph? No. I don't think so. No. 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 This is just the, this is just the the, elective, the dynamos, the generators themselves. The exciter is the one on the right. The little one is the exciter. The big one is the oh, the, that's the exciter. Exciter, and this is the this is what drove what created right. the electrical current. Yeah. And then there were diesel generators for backup. Yeah. Right. Uh, I, I, the steam that drove those. It, it was different than the steam that he did. No, it's the same steam. Same steam. So the steam is like recycled and sent out. You could recycle it, or you could divert some of it and, and run some the other way uh -huh. for heating, depending yeah. on what you were doing. It's effectively a waste product from the creation of electricity. Right. The, the pressure and temperature of the steam is different for different purposes. Yeah. Must be some engineers in the room. <laughs> One, two. Oh, and I love how uh, neat and clean everything looks and how well lit this space is. Now, you might know this building. Uh, I always called this building uh, George's shop. Uh, but this uh, cinder block structure was constructed uh, about seven or eight years after the power plant went online, right. and it has nothing to do with generating power or electricity. Right. Those hoppers there, what it actually has to do with, oh, and there it is today, and my speaking companion here, walking mm -hmm. down along the side of it. Uh, this building was actually uh, built for corn. Yeah. Pioneer Seed Corn Company was selecting areas in the air, around in various parts of the country to send their new hybridized seed corn for trials. How does it, how does it work? How does it produce? And one of the places that they chose was Antioch College to run the seed corn, one of the portions of the seed corn project. And the actual, do you have the picture of the, of the guy plowing? The actual Eventually. plants were up on Clifton Pike, top of the hill as you come up Grinnell Road, and those fields out there were at Mr. Corey Farms today. If you look to the, if you come up Grinnell to the hill, top of the hill, if you look across to, on your left hand side, you can see a small building back in the, in the trees there, and that was one of the buildings used in the fields to keep track of the stuff. And they were bringing the corn here, it was originally uh, the project was originally managed by one of the Nosker brothers, mm -hmm. and he then called upon a fellow named uh, Lloyd Kennedy to come build, to the village and help him with this project. This is a letter that's signed by L. W. Kennedy, <coughs> right? And Mr. Kennedy was here as his assistant. Mr. Nosker passed away, and Mr. Kennedy took over the project. So he was. That's how he came to be here. And so you might know him as the leading figure of the Yellow Springs Tree <coughs> Committee for as long as anybody could ever. Um, I've actually uh, uh, been through the, the minutes of the governing body uh, at the college called Administrative Council. And uh, one day in an Administrative Council meeting, uh, Al Joe Henderson, who was our president, just told the group, uh, Henry Wallace wants us to be in on his corn project. <laughs> if it's just this one sentence about that. Uh, and so Henry Wallace was the, uh, the founder and CEO of Pioneer uh, Corn uh, out in Iowa, and uh, also was a progressive industrialist and politician. He would ultimately be vice president of the United States and secretary of agriculture uh, and ran for president. And his <laughs> nephew attended the college. Uh, and I don't really know why he wanted the college involved in this project. But that's why this building was built, right. uh, was to house this uh, 
study of uh, uh, a high yield uh, <coughs> corn species that had been really invented at Ohio State, but was now being uh, test marketed um, out. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and this corn poppers or whatever uh, were there at the power plant because the trains could pull up. I actually don't know why it was chosen as the location. Okay. Yeah, uh, but they, it was probably delivered by train. May well have been. May well have been. Or, as you can see here, this is the back side of a big old truck. Mm -hmm. uh, brought it down the hill and brought it in on trucks. Yeah, yeah and that's a wagon full of corn. <laughs> but that, that building was <coughs> built for the seed corn project. And George had his shop in one side of it, and then mm -hmm. Ted Bowley started his woodworking business in one part of it. And then later moved up to Houston Road, or yeah, up in Houston. Um, so here's one of the uh, um, uh, handbills that was generated at the college to promote uh, this high-bred corn, which is actually hybrid. Hybrid was the brand name. Um, and uh, yeah, you're right in our biology department at Antioch College to learn more. Now, as Casey pointed out, there were specific uh, places that this stuff was cultivated. Right, and if you look, this is up at the top of the hill, up on the, if you go to the crossroads of Grinnell Road and Clifton Pike, this would be in the south east corner. Mm -hmm. Look back way over in the back, you can see uh, the barn from the Cory Farm, which is, stands today. So that gives you a sense of where that was, where that was planted. <laughs> and so they cultivate this corn, and then uh, they would record the yields that they got, and then they would report back to, exactly. to Pioneer with the results. And that helped uh, really Pioneer uh, kind of capture this market. Uh, it must have been in the 2000 aughts that uh, a, a student at the college that had just graduated uh, came up to uh, Antioch, Indiana, said that uh, his family had a farm in Iowa, and without hybrid corn, they would not still have their farm in Iowa. It, uh, you know, it made that much money for farm. Question. Yeah. What was going on with the engineers on the third floor? <laughs> of the science building. Well, the science building third floor uh, was uh, given over to Kettering's photosynthesis project. Yeah. So they were researching what the how that works. Why is grass green? That's exactly the question that they were asking. Why is grass green? <laughs> yep. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They built the corn building down there because they used steam from the power plant to dry the corn. To dry the corn. Oh, oh excellent. That makes sense. Okay. That's why that's why it's here. Yes, sir. Lloyd Kennedy brought a gentleman named Ray Snyder who owned that yes. parcel of land. Oh, yes. And that was the largest test plot east of the Mississippi for quite a number of years. My wife and I live on a piece of that today, which was the homestead, was Ray's homestead. Uh, and the Tecumseh Land Trust holds an easement on that property to preserve it. Which, we're talking that southeast South corner. corner. Yeah, okay, all right. Line, yeah. So that really elevates Antioch's role in all of this because it's such a large plot. Mm -hmm. uh, the largest and plot. so they were really the counting on these results from us. Yeah, George. Well, that corn building we call the Antioch Woodshop at the right. Bowley left, and it was not, in my experience, clean and well lit. No, <laughs> nor was it decoded by any means. <laughs> Uh, it was an agricultural yeah. structure. It yeah, was funky, but <laughs> Bowley actually was in the theater building for a while after the foundry cleared out, and uh, that's why the uh, theater department had such wonderful woodworking tools to build their sets. There you go. Oh, very nice. Yes, they did. Uh, and so, uh, pointing out that uh, you know it wasn't as clean and well lit as it once had been. These are some of the last photographs that Antioch Vienna has of it uh, when the power plant was still operational. Huh. And up those steps there uh, are those dynamos that we saw in the earlier shot. When did it become non-operational? The when Antioch College was closed in 2008, the uh, the power plant was shut down that for good. And was if I that's a good question. And I asked David that was the was the power plant ever cold up until the time? In other words, there was no no heat going on in there at all up until the time that they finally closed it down. No, it was always, always there was always so that 2008. But the fuel changed. 
fuel change. Yes, it did. In the 90s, we went to natural gas. And then it was fuel oil. This is the tank, what you can see at the end of it behind me there. It was up on the upper level as you pull in to go to George's shop or the wood shop. That tank sat over on the left. Well, Casey, who, who took most of these photos? <coughs> My wife, Irina, did these, these, these newer ones, which I thank her very much because we, we got permission from um, Nick Budis to go down there. He said, now, don't go in the building. Oh no, we won't. <laughs> but we went around and took pictures of the, of the uh, oil tank, and there was a. And then they went to gas at one point, natural gas, and out on the siding there was a large, you know, regulator, I guess, for lack of a better term, where the natural gas came in and it was piped down into the in the plant itself. This is up on the upper level, looking toward the shops. There's a bridge <coughs> here that goes across the, the edge of the quarry into the, the shop space itself and there were two actually two buildings up there or two entrances up there and this is <coughs> on, on the left closer to Quarry Street these are all gone yep this was down back down below this is back down at the power plant itself mm. looking just into the side of it these are the were the coal chutes over here on this side that big transformer there was when they were no longer making electricity but using electricity that came in from the outside. This is a shot from inside. These are the ends of the boilers. You can, if you look, you can see the, sorry, the yeah. side of the boiler here. And these are the, they provided the fuel into the, the firebox of the boilers in order to create the <coughs> There's a little better shot. Okay. Yeah. Now these these were electronically controlled, were they not, David? Yeah. So you had the, the devices right here, that you could see what was going on with your fuel feed and that kind of stuff that was going into the boiler. There was another one over here, just on the side. There were seven of them. Seven total. Who, who, who put the smiley on the... <laughs> uh, this is, this is what That's a great question. Is. This is humanity. Monkeys with spray paint. Monkeys with spray paint. And they may be back for more. I mean, it's, 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 it's a wonder. When we went down in there, it's a wonder no one was badly injured yeah. fooling yeah. around down there because the place is a mess. Was it this is that this shut down? Yeah, this is like, how long ago did you take these, we take those pictures? What? Probably no more than a month. A month ago. Oh. This is uh, like five days before yeah, they started demolition. About a week before they tore it down. Yeah. Yeah, really this is looking back into, now this would have been up on the floor where the actual generators were. Yes, sir. Go well, back up to the picture of the coal box. There, uh, yes. The, the little sandy there is where Morris Bean got invented. Okay. The Morris Bean Foundry. There were two German fellows imported by Morgan using the last lost wick. With wax Lost process. wax process. And they had a little oil cave down there, and Sarifa Bean joined them, and once she learned how they were doing it, the Germans disappeared. Sounds like her. They have disappeared. <laughs> so there's that same space. Right. Same space, much later. Much later. Yeah. This is another shot. Now this is looking at the exhaust ends of the boiler. So you can see that the stacks going up and out. And they, there were a number of things that had been taken off of them. They'd been opened up. Um, I don't know who did that or why, but it was. They tell how it was disappearing from the college. Exactly. Yes, they did. This is another shot from outside, looking back toward the uh, the coal chutes, the siding, the rail siding is right up at the very top where they could pull the car in off the main line, and <coughs> dump the coal into the chutes. Got another one. Yeah, yeah just yeah, the just fancy reference picture. Star. You know, reference picture. What a difference. See what? What year were the cars? Thirties. Probably in the late yeah. 20s, early 30s. Yep. <coughs> That's a model right here. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, but it's a fancy one. So yeah. Yep. 30, 30 plus. This is the the corn project building from the the quarry wall side, looking back toward the uh, where the pond would be, and those lines going across the top were at one point used to heat the upstairs portions of the building. And as George said, they weren't real efficient. That's all right. Friable as best as should. Yeah. There's this is around back. This is the base wow. of the stack. Mm -hmm. You can see an access opening here, and how how overgrown the whole thing was five days before they started the demolition. What were these shoots for, David? Those big red shoots. Fly ash. In, okay. Fly ash. Fly ash out of the stack, yeah. and so they could catch capture it and get rid of it. <coughs> trying to think where there's lines going around, but yeah, yeah know, you can also. I know at one time the fly ash was used on the trails in the Glen. Right. Yeah. There was a special motorized uh, wheelbarrow that distributed it along the and trails. Along with the cinders too, from the, yeah. the coal cinders that were used after it was taken out of the, out of the fire boxes. Mm -hmm. So they used so a lot of waste. Yeah. Those two bins up there too are totally covered in friable asbestos. Oh yes, it was all over the place. And the big to the right. And how they got away with just going in there and uh, yeah, all that was removed prior to that. What? Okay. It would have to be. This is the, correct me if I'm wrong, George, this is where the water goes out of where the pond. Right. So in effect, it's actually a dam and it sets the height of the of pond. The, of the pond, of the level in the pond. But you can, it's still open and you can still hear the water draining through it at times. But also, again, how overgrown the whole thing has gotten. Another shot of the coal shoots. Looking back through with some really great graffiti. <laughs> There's another one looking into the entryway going into base where those cars were parked. Yeah, that right. earlier photograph. Looking back up over top of the shoots. At one point, they took about how many feet off the top of the stack? You remember? Yeah, I think it was ten or twelve feet. Yeah. And they capped it. Well, that's after they shut it down. Moisture got into it and it froze. Started to break down the brick. Yes. Yeah. And uh, it's so they put the cap on top of it to keep it from deteriorating any further. What's that pipe for, Case? Which one? This big one right here. Would have been the, the hot, oh. hot water hot steam. Yes. That's the main electric team going on campus. Right. So that's how all the things that it did got got to the, the buildings this, of the This college. went on over, went underneath Corey Street, and then on up toward campus. There you could, that's a much better shot of the lines going underneath Corey Street. But they didn't have a machine at that those tunnels, did they? They probably used rock drills and dynamite. Oh, ouch. Because, as, as, as you know, that's yeah. just bedrock yeah. all the way up through there. Because the, the, the tunnels, did you ever go down in the tunnels? No. We did in high school. <laughs> <laughs> and probably 30, 36, 40 inches wide, and you'd have to stoop down or crawl on the pipes to get through there. But we would crawl in the, the one access hole there on the sidewalk over what was South College Street and crawl up there and go all the way up to main building. <laughs> well, you want to go back to the parking lot, two shots back here. That yeah. one? Oh, yeah. In the 60s, my father and some Antioch students planted some very interesting prairie stuff in that parking lot. And there's actually these amazing little pink flowers, and I think there's probably no more now. Some very interesting plants. It's not just a waste dump. It was anyway. For your information. No, that's not yeah. great. Uh, this was, I ran and took this one at my request because this is in the pond. You can see the painted turtles. There were about seven of them on the log when we happened to be down there. When we were kids, we fished in there. The guys that ran the plant had put fish in there and some big bass, and I think, I don't think 
They would never take any bait we threw in there. They'd just sit there and look at it and go the other way. <laughs> now you're getting into the, the, the way old timer story. Right. <laughs> now there's a professor at Antioch who was a Russian guy named Lepkowski. Okay. And he lived on up core extension, and he was a hell of a fisherman. <coughs> you're right, those fish just ignored us kids. Oh, yeah, did. He spent hours down there, and finally he caught one. And he called my dad, sure, and he had it in the kitchen sink, and this sucker was like coming out of the sink. It was so funny. They were beautiful, bass. big, large mouth bass. Awesome. Yeah. But they That's wouldn't the only one I ever saw. That's how they got so big. <laughs> and the man that George is talking about, Vlad Lutkowski, uh, was a captain in the Didn't Polish try. Merchant Marine. Yes. But he also ended up with a piece of property on Quarry Street, and the first thing he did is he didn't build a house, he built a pond. Yeah. <laughs> is that the one out there off yeah. the bend? Yeah, yeah. Great old still yeah. 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 There's a house break fit. Yep, and there you see. This is an aerial shot from some uh, footage from, that uh, Joe nice. Ayers took from a, nice. uh, a drone. Mm. And he, had a, he did some drone stuff for Richard. They were, they were looking at, at the roof of the main building to see what shape it was in. And so he flew the drone out around, and this was shot from up just a, uh, would have been south of the smokestack. That was a long time, or a few years ago, because those rooftops all had graffiti on them. Okay. <laughs> yes, it is. A, it was an earlier shot. It was within 10 years. Yeah. This is one. I don't know who took this one recently, but you can see that it's also from Joe's drone. Okay, everything out except their, their coal, what's left of the coal chutes. The shops are all gone. This was the uh, location for the that big oil tank that you saw, and you're looking over toward the Antioch farm, the solar panels, the foundry theater, and then the art building. An interesting, another ha ha story. Uh, when I was, it would have been 1963, the summer I was working for the area theater, and we were doing productions in the amphitheater. And we had just struck a set for one of the productions, and we were, spent all night moving the stuff out, getting ready, brought in the platforms for the next production. We we're going to get everything set up. Whitney LeBlanc was uh, technical director, so he's, we're gonna, the daylight's getting good, we're gonna paint them. So we're out there with pans of paint and rollers, and they used to blow the steam up the stack periodically to make sure it was cleaned out. <laughs> and they did it, and here's this cloud of fly ash and soot over and it came down all in the wet paint. <laughs> so we, <laughs> we ended up painting it gray. <laughs> but yeah, was, I know what's happening. And then there was a guy, an older guy there, and he said, oh yeah, I remember in the Navy when they used to do that. And he said, that's what they're doing. They're blowing steam up the stack to clean it out. There's one, another one that still shows the chutes. That was like the last stuff to go. Yeah. You can see people standing <coughs> down here. All gone. All gone. Did they knock that down with like a tractor or something? No, it, they, what did they have to Excavator. probably use? Yeah, it was a big, yeah, huge factory. Yeah. 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 It's uh, interesting now that the triples are out of the way. But that's a nice, uh, almost looks like a laid up stone wall. Now. Yeah, exactly. But they're going to have to do some serious um, barricading because if you go over there and look, that's a heck of a drop right now. Yeah, and it actually substituted one attractive nuisance for another. Yeah. Is, that the, is that the edge of the quarry? The, I mean, behind the, yeah. the yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, right here. That would be the original right. wall of the quarry. Yeah. And if you, um, yeah, along with this demolition, I don't know whether you got a picture of it or not, you drive down Quarry Street. You remember those two great big slabs of concrete that were further down toward Grinnell Road? They removed those as well. That's the older quarry, right? That's the, so yes, sir. Well, do, you, do you know what that was for, in that, those older slabs? That didn't look like a quarry to me. Well, it was. Peter Townsend told me what they were used for, and it was, I, it was either a crusher or a device for loading the... Uh, Rail car. 
Yeah, yes, like a loading base the or a crane or something. Yeah. Loading yeah. crushed limestone into into rail cars. There seem to be two six-inch water lines that ran from there to the power plant. I have no idea what those are for. Go on. Yep, can't can't tell you. And we thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Now that you have that picture up there, <laughs> this is front campus. Right. And the, and the two buildings behind it were North South Hall, and behind them was the privies. Everybody who's been by Antioch now considers uh, Livermore Street to be more or less front campus. Right. right. Did President Street ever go through? No. Not to my knowledge. I don't know. And the, the utilities that are running through that area make it such that you would believe that President Street at one point in time may have run through and caught the end of Herman Street and, and went all the way over to Allen. So the earliest map we know of the village is 1855 uh -huh. and it shows the college campus and it shows the two stubs of President Street on each end. It's still stubs. So in the not, not, it wasn't a street as far as as far as uh, President any documentation says. between Allen Street and up to the campus, and right. that has been more or less abandoned. So the, the closest roadway is either off to the side or walking all the way out to Corn Street <coughs> to, to be on the front campus and, and get somewhere. Yeah, you have to, essentially access nothing. Okay. It was on the railroad. Yeah, yeah. 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 it was always yeah. tall. Yeah. That first picture where it's a denuded ag field and there's the three buildings. That right. was 1848? 60. 1860. So that dates all the trees. Right. They were all planted. And for some reason, there's not a single white oak on that campus, yeah. which is the most important native tree. So that's very interesting. That's an interesting and you don't have to have a dendrologist to figure that's how old those trees are. Wow. <laughs> you had a question, David? Oh, there was a four-story outhouse connected to North Hall. Right. It's right here. See it. yeah. yeah, and it was in toward in, inside or yeah. toward the horseshoe as we know <laughs> the horseshoe today. That's where the, yes. The big tank that they just took out was yes. for fuel oil storage when they ran the diesel engines at the power plant. Yeah. And it had to be big enough to hold the tank car full of so oil. fuel oil, yeah. yeah. And I don't know where they did. I saw it going up 68 one morning on the back of a truck, and then they went up 343, and I disappeared up there. I don't know where it is unless it's over on the village farm property off of 343. But it was it it was a big tank. How many hundred thousand gallons? I mean, it, I think some. It was only one and a half rail cars full of fuel oil. It would right. They took it out whole. Didn't yeah. break it apart. Nope. They put it on the back of a big flatbed truck and towed it up about 343. So I don't know where it went. I think it's out at the village farm, but I'm not sure. I don't think so. No? I think it got recycled. Maybe out with John a piece of money. <laughs> where would you take it, George? The thing because it blocked the entire road. There's a there's, there's a recycling yard that that has a scrap cut yeah. safely. Anyway, it was it was something to see it going up 68 because they had to shut the road down up at the, the stoplight at 343 in order to get it by yes. But, uh, <clears throat> this is not how yeah. but since you're talking about campus, I've been wondering for about uh, maybe 60 years why they call the golf course the golf course. Because it used to be a golf course. Was it actually yes. Yeah, it really was. It was. A nice one. <laughs> Five or six holes. Like holes. They had bunkers. <coughs> they had sand traps. They had yes. Very what period? Go ahead. Very what period? Oh well, we as kids we used to go out there and play and fly kites on it. I don't know when they stopped. When I worked there, we were still mowing it, but it wasn't a golf course anymore. But it was just open ground. Uh, my dad was a boy. He, he would uh, caddy at Jimmy Town, a golf course in James Town. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think they abandoned it when Bill Gerhardt died. <laughs> well, yeah, well, I did. He, he I used to service the thing. And the service the car. Because our, yeah. And, uh, yeah. Well, I think a conclusion to be drawn from that is that Yellow Springs used to be a lot more connected with the scions of the city of Dayton. 
and that was used. NCR had their golf course, Antioch has their <laughs> golf course, and so on, and golfing buddies are what actually what made the old male world of the 30s turn. Yeah, but uh, Antioch's golf course was integrated, brother. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in the 60s, you'd see the guys out there pumping away, and there was no, uh, there was no, there was no did, did somebody have a question about the tank, one yeah. of the tanks that? The fuel oil tank. The fuel oil tank, Where it was, went. that was recycled. So okay. the Fillmore, the construction company, right. took it out and brought it down to their, their facility down south, and then they are going to reuse it. Or, or reuse it. They're going to reuse it for the, they have a large construction uh, company. Richard. Isn't it, I heard that there was a period when Kettering would come to Antioch by flying over from Bayonne and well land have. on the golf course. So before it was the golf course, <laughs> it was an airstrip. Or at least an open uh, field. I only know one plane that was ever landed, landed, landed back from science, and it's the uh, the war surplus trainer that uh, a, a student, a Navy veteran, you know, in the late 40s, uh, drove up to Columbus, picked it up, flew it to campus, landed it back of science because it was the widest open space on campus, uh, and so and that's the last time that plane ever flew. <laughs> and disassembled and put it in the engineering building so they can do things with it. Okay. Ah, Hold on. Kettering had two airplanes. He had a little one called the Blue Tail Flea and a big one called Blue Tail Fly. <laughs> and he used to uh, fly in from Kettering to the golf course in a little Blue Tail Flea. <laughs> there, there you go. <laughs> Scott, do you know? about what the power plant cost when it was built? Yeah, we had, I can tell you, right here. That's right. We do have the, we do we have those have figures. The, oh, you can tell how much it Thanks to Dave Erskine's room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have to, I Probably should also give price. credit to Dave Erskine because he sent me this interesting paper that was written by his roommate, Hank Rogers, back in 1956 that gives a lot of the details of what our presentation was today. <laughs> You know the science building overall was a three hundred thousand dollar project. Okay, the whole total for the original plant was one hundred forty-five thousand eight hundred fifty-nine dollars and fifteen cents. <laughs> the additions, the additions to the system were a water softener and pump, a three hundred kilowatt diesel engine, plant transformers, town electrical distribution and in 1939, three 60 kilowatt diesels. And that came to a grand total of $70,953. So the whole thing, $216,812.58. Just, just for reference purposes, that's more than it costs to carry down. So I believe so we, we have to, if you consider the the um, ESAs, the environmental site assessments, we did a phase one, a phase two, we did a survey, um, uh, asbestos survey assessment, we removed all the asbestos and uh, checked for any uh, toxic chemicals and so forth. So it was a clean plant before that thing was before they demo. Before they and uh, if you add all that up and the demolition, you're a little over, a little over 300,000. Does that figure include landscaping? No, this does not include landscaping. <laughs> yes, sir. Dave, what was, what was the source of the DC power fee originally? It came up with the, um, along the traction, the traction line, line from Xenia. And as I said early in the, the presentation, we had some street lighting, and they used some of that DC power for <coughs> street lights, but they were, and at night when the line shut down, it was turned off and it just shut the electric off. <coughs> the other interesting thing, and that ties into your question, today the village demand for electricity is a thousand times what it was when this power plant went online and provided electricity to the village. Mm. So, yeah, we're, yes sir. This take over here was shaking his head when you said you got the DC from Zinger. Where did it come from, David? A Midway. Medway. Midway. Okay. That's a long way to transport <laughs> DC. Well, they had a combination of AC and DC from Midway. Okay. Mm -hmm. huh. And that little inventor station down at Goes mm -hmm. converted it. Okay. Because uh, okay. there were, there's a, yeah, there's, 
Okay. It's that weird. And if you sense. did any electrical work in the town around here in the last <laughs> 40 years, the way <laughs> the grid was set up, it, it, was, it was scary. <laughs> you had to be real careful what you were doing. Yes, I, I mean, uh, historically in this country, there was a battle between AC and DC. Yes, well, that Westinghouse was and Westinghouse Is that still and going? No, no, not at that point. No. Yes, I just want to mention. I jokingly said drain the swamp, but uh, actually, it's a beautiful wetland there. It we is. saw the tur turtles, and and the area that they cleared, uh, water's coming up out of the ground. So it's it's a naturally fed spring, right. and we're going to have another wetland in there. I hope so. I hope it will they, they form naturally. Yes, sir. At the intersection of Gordon and uh, Meadow Lane. Okay. There's an old street lamp on the pump. Yeah. And is that original? No. I'd have to look at it. Some no. of the old ones had, had the crenellated reflector. Yes, Scott Todd. I was, I was born and raised on it. It's that Orton and that. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Kate will put those in. Um, they came from someplace south of Xenia. Oh, yeah. And uh, <laughs> those little triangles that. that Horton Road and again at Allen and, and, and so on. Those were like little pet projects. And, uh, 50. Sort of a neighborhood park idea that he just decided to do. Yeah. There you go. So we done it. Yes, sir. Dave, part of the scariness of the electric system goes back to the businesses on Key Sally. I mean, the, the newspaper was one of them. Right. Call. They had a different wiring scheme. <laughs> than we use today. Yeah. Today it brings a delta or a Y. Exactly. And they had this high leg. That's called a wild leg. I remember when we converted that. 176 <laughs> volts to ground. It was dangerous. So you got to be careful. You get in the box yeah. and if believe me. <laughs> wild leg. <laughs> you didn't go ahead. Smoke my, I, I, I worked with a guy who was uh, in a building where that Wild leg was present. We had three phase electric coming in, and there were, if you looked in the panel, every third slot was empty. And we were running a bunch of, sing, you know, just single phase motors in there, and we had lighting and out and regular 110 outlets. And well, he got the bright idea he was going to put some more electric lighting in there. Hey, we got plenty of space in the panel. So we put up all these eight or these, yeah, these eight foot fixtures in the ceiling. Two bulb, the old T12 two bulb fixtures. Got them all wired up, wired it back down to the panel and in, in there, and it came time to turn it on, and they lit up for about two seconds. Because <laughs> 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 it. it was putting that much, it was, yeah, 100, 176 volts. <laughs> it wasn't too bad. Sir? It wasn't too bad. No, it wasn't, but it's still there. It's still there. Where is that? Sir? Where? I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> Actually, uh, our, the street lamp circuit that you were talking about right. that was DC. Yes. Later on, when everything turned into AC electric, that street lamp circuit is still being used for the downtown and some of the surrounding, and, and it's a 277. Uh, I believe it. Set up. I mean, it, they've done, done amazing things in the village with the electric system. Uh, as it is today. No, I'm serious. It's, they have. And considering what there was to work with, and when you think about, you know, the poles and the, just the actual wires and making sure everything's anchored and the squirrels can't get on it, it it's, it's a huge, it's a huge task. And they've, they've done a lot to make our electric, our electric service a lot more reliable. Sir? Since you speak about electric, I just want to let you know that uh, at the power plant, there were, and, and you saw the steam tunnel. To the right of that are two large cement junction boxes where the, the lines went back through to Antioch. Right. And there were still three sets of uh, three phase in there, high voltage. Um, so we call in a commercial company. <coughs> they made sure that everything was disconnected from the Antioch side properly. And then we pulled the entire wire sets out. So there's absolutely hmm. no wire in the, ground, in, the top. in the power plant. Is the, all the asbestos still down in the tunnels? The asbestos was taken back 10 feet from the cliff and then 
what's going under the road back to your side is, is still there. It's still there. Because we, as I say, we crawled around in there as kids, so it's a, <laughs> it's a wonder I can still <laughs> breathe. <laughs> Did you have anything else? Any other questions? Thank you. Comments? <laughs> Thank you for coming. Hey, we have some fresh